Good day, Strategy Gamers, and welcome back to episode 15 of our Let's Play series of War in the East 2, Stalingrad to Berlin scenario. In this episode, we're going to be covering the second half of turn 8 and finishing up our ground movement phase from the Stalingrad front down to the Transcaucus region. We're also going to be looking at a feature of the game that we have not yet covered, but comes highly recommended by veterans of both the game and the series. And then we will also end our turn and uh, see how the German uh, executes their air and ground combat phases. Considering we got a little further than usual in our last episode, um, we may end up actually... Uh, going a little bit into turn 9 a little further than we usually would if we end up going well on time. Um, where we left off in last episode was right here in this pocket, and I, um, <laughs> how to put it, w was having a lot of doubts about what my plan was and how exactly um, we were going to move forward from here. And one of the reasons for that is... Uh, we find ourselves with 130, 30 some odd units that are in low supply. Uh, it's currently heavy snowfall on the ground and the weather forecast for next turn is blizzard. So given all of those things, it's not really a recipe for next turn our supply situation improving. Add on top of that, that we've actually been so successful in some of our advances that we're now starting to advance past the capability of our supply line. So in the Stalingrad front, we see here that these two primary rail supply lines are currently broken, and even if, or not broken, they are damaged, and even if they were not damaged, because we have not yet taken Stalingrad, we would not be able to pass any supplies along on those as the rail line is interrupted. Now, just because the rail line is interrupted does not mean that it's impossible to get supplies to units, but this severely hampers our ability to do so. And this is just the Stalingrad pocket. If we look south here at the Caucasus region, all of this territory that we've taken needs to have the rail lines repaired. And we are going to get to a point where the supply situation is desperate here. When we look up near the Smolensk front, it's not as severe, but it's still pretty noticeable that we have this entire branch of the line is currently damaged, so nothing's getting down here from the north. And Rezhev was always kind of the crossroads historically. Both sides knew that. And two out of the four lines coming out of Rezhev have damage and supply issues. So that has put extreme pressure on our Smolensk front as well. So I end it last episode sitting here in this particular pocket and I was really starting to have doubts of how aggressive should we be in these turns because looking at the situation it, it does seem um, like we're on the verge or the precipice of overextending ourselves and when we look at these units here I mean they're they're pretty gosh darn well surrounded and we have a strong force here, but we really don't have enough to come up and reinforce them that strongly. So we had actually, for example, up here moved back some units to try to um, reinforce this line. And I think we're going to continue a pattern where, where there is a German presence within a hex or two, we're going to play more conservative. And in some cases, even pull back one or two hexes which might feel really strange and unnatural, especially given how these first eight turns have gone and this kind of being the historical tipping point where the Soviets started to really, really have a bit of an advantage. Again, throughout history, there were, there were spikes in between of, of German counterattacks and offensives, most namely in 1943 was the Kursk offensive. Um, but really, at this point, this is kind of where the war tipped to. It was looking better for the Soviets. So this pocket right here is a really difficult one because I really do want to pull these units back off of the line. This is one of the very few situations in the rest of this episode, I think, where we're actually going to be here a little aggressive. And, and the biggest reason for that is that when you look at the position of this hex, 
it's going to have such a disruptive impact to the Germans' ability to supply all of these units here that I'm hopeful that if we can hold this hex, it will then put enough pressure on the Germans that they will be forced to withdraw. If next turn they counterattack this hex and they go at it strongly and we were, we're taking casualties and it's looking like we not, might not hold out that much longer, we'll probably pull back. But for now, I think we're going to hold this hex as is. And what we're going to do is we're going to take up the six guard and we're just going to move it up one. So then we have these two stacks of three here that are kind of defending these two hexes. And then we're going to take this 190th rifle division and move that over. And this is going to kind of be our, our line now. We'll have this little gap here. I don't expect that they're going to try to push through because I don't know what they would necessarily accomplish. As long as we can hold these three hexes, I think we're going to be okay in in our position in this pocket of the front. Um, moving on further to the east on the Stalingrad front, we see here that they started to pull in a couple of uh, motorized and panzer divisions. And there's also some more down here that we don't even have necessarily reconnaissance on. So in these pockets, this specifically, which is the third guard's army, um, we're actually just going to, to hold right where we are. We're not going to move any further there. I do see that we have this unit, which is part of the Third Guard's army. And what we're going to do with that is just bring it over to the HQ. So then it is closer to its actual army unit. Right here, these two units, we're going to leave them for now. And I, I've thought a lot about this. My method for this pocket of the front on Stalingrad is we are going to advance until we encounter any notable contact with enemy forces, but specifically, we are going to advance along these two lines of supply. In the middle pocket here, on this flank, we're not necessarily going to be pushing ourselves forward. So we just want to see along this rail line um, what's out there. That, that's kind of the goal. So I think we're going to take this cavalry, cavalry unit, and it's in, its fuel supply is low, but its ammunition and its other supplies aren't bad. It is a little high on fatigue, so actually maybe we're going to take this rifle division. And we're just going to slowly advance one hex at a time up this front line. Okay, so we ran into absolutely no resistance there. So now I'm going to take this cavalry unit and we're going to move this up here. And that did deplete our fuel supplies by 2%, which isn't too bad. And we're just going to take these units and we're just going to advance up this rail line in kind of a column fashion. Okay. And we'll bring up the tank core. I'm trying to be very mindful of looking at all the stats of these particular units, right, to see what their status is. I think this one we will bring all the way up to this um, city that the cavalry unit is in. And then that's kind of where they'll hold. And then here we're, we're just going to bring these units up a little bit, not, not much. So we'll move you there, move you here. And then here we have this 21st Army. We're just going to take these and move them up a little bit. But we're not going to go as far as we did here on this rail line. Just kind of adding a little bit of depth to our lines is what we're doing. We want to keep most of these with their respective units. I'm actually going to move this over to kind of the western edge of the line here. And then we're going to take the, it's the second guards army is what these belong to. We're going to take their HQ unit and we're going to move them up. And then we're going to take the 21st army and we're going to move up their HQ unit. And up here we have two pieces of the 21st army that we're going to advance to here, I think. 
Okay. So the objective of the 21st Army is just kind of in this column fashion to, to have advanced a little bit up this line of supply the Germans previously occupied here. Um, these units, especially for right now, actually, uh, this is the 57th Army and the Stalingrad. Oh, excuse me, the 57th Army and the 169th. No, geez, forgive me. We actually have a bit of a mixture. So the 57th Army are these units here, and they're just going to hold exactly where they are for now. Over here, we're going to take this third guards, and they seem like they're in a decent supply situation. We're going to move up to this city. That went okay. And we're going to go just a little further. Do we dare go one more? I think we will. And we captured that depot. So hopefully that will interrupt them a little bit. What we'll probably end up doing is as we move the 65th Army up, I think we will probably change this HQ unit over to the 65th Army. I think. Let's keep moving all of these units up. And again, the intent here is just where there is infrastructure to be taken, we're going to take it. That That's kind of the plan with all of this. And then we're going to take these units and we're going to get them again back focused near their, their army. Right, so we kind of have this column advance of the 65th Army up along this rail line. And here we're just going to hold. Could we move forward? Sure. Are there unlikely German forces there? Yeah, probably unlikely. The reason we're not, I don't want to expend morale and supplies, not morale, excuse me, fatigue and supplies unnecessarily to take territory that is just going to be further away from our own supply and not on any infrastructure and of no tactical importance at all to us. So they are just going to sit here holding this line right here. What we are going to do with the 51st Army is they are going to um, not necessarily advance into this pocket, but I'm just going to condense them down a little where they're a little closer to this rail line um, in a bit of a pocket formation. So that way it's just a little easier for them to stay together, for the supplies to get to a couple of hexes. Just hopefully overall makes things a little easier. So we'll take these units here, I think. This unit I did forget we wanted to move to Sixty fifth Army. Okay. And then here, we're actually just going to hold right where we are with this entire army, the 28th Army. Not going to move it. Not in the slightest. They're going to stay just where they are. Um, these are part of the 44th Army, it looks like. The 44th Army, we are just going to move a couple of these to take these rail lines here. But that is the extent of everything. Right. And I think we're just going to bring these up here so that way when all of this is repaired, they're at the very least on that line and we don't have to go across what's the terrain here? Probably just planes. I think it is. To, to go across that to get them resupplied. Right? So we, we're just trying to create a couple of pockets here. Uh, we're going to go back up to Stalingrad. Uh, before we continue too far into the Caucasus region. And we've been trying to be a little conservative in how quickly we're pushing in on this pocket. That, that's what we have been doing thus far. I still have not made up my mind about this. So this is going to be a bit of an in-the-moment decision. But my thought here is 
maybe we are at the point where it is worth pressing an offensive here on this Stalingrad pocket for the sake of our supply lines. Because I wonder if the cost of being more aggressive in our attacks here, whether or not it's actually more costly than what's happening by having these units turn after turn in a worse supply situation every turn. I think we might be getting to the point where we just need to start trying to clear this a little. And when we remove those uh, chips there, you really can see that this is the hub of these four lines of supply out here to the east, up to the northwest, and then down to the south. They all go through Stalingrad. You scroll out here, I think about here is where you're going to best be able to still see rail lines. This entire area, nothing, no rail. This entire pocket here, no rail, just through Stalingrad. And, th and this, again, reinforces why it was historically, well, okay, one of the reasons that historically it was so important. Um, there was also a bit of a, a feud thing going on between two dictators, right? But um, that aside, it's, it, it also had geographic importance. So let's take a look here to see if there's anything we can do to try to further compress and, and press down on the pocket. So... If we were to take all these units, what are our odds here? 16 to 2. I like that, don't you? I like that. What about, though, we take these units and try to cut off this unit here? I like that even more, right? Because then it allows us to encircle the two divisions there to the west. So let's do that. So they held, but their fort was reduced to zero. So that, that's helpful to us. I think we're going to attack again. Ooh, we don't even have one to one then. Maybe we won't. What about here? 10 to two, let's do it. All right. So we pushed them back and we captured the depot that was there. Now, unfortunately, it looks like the depot was empty. But other than that, still good news, we captured the depot going to move up a couple of units here. Don't think they're going to counterattack, but I, even though these units are weak and they're getting pressed a little on fatigue, I don't want to leave it empty. And then let's take these and see if we can't break through here. 17 to 5, we'll try it. They surrendered and retreated. That's great news that one of them surrendered. And then we'll look to see... Which units do we want to advance into that position? Okay, so this entire stack has fatigue levels at 75, 80, and 84. Holy crap, those guys need a rest. This stack, they're all at 65. Wow! This stack is 79, 92, and 86. That is tough. That is just a tough situation. Um, okay. Let's keep looking to see where else we can try to push. What about here with all these units? It's 40 to 20. Don't know about that. What about these in this little corner? 40 to 20 again. And if we go here, 22 to 18 here 21 to 27 so where might it be more important to attack thinking here and this is a tough one for me because I know we're crossing a river and I know their fortification level is at 4 but it just feels like we're, we're kind of getting to the point that we have to do something what if are either of those armies or not armies, but units in a better position in terms of strength. They have lower fatigue, but their combat values are pretty much the same. So I think we will take all of these, and we're going to press here. They held us. Okay. 
they held. But we did reduce their fortification level down to a 3. So that that's not nothing. Now if we take off this unit off the front line, and if we now bring in this unit, and if we take this unit off the front line, and again, swap it out here right for a more reinforced unit, what does it look like now? Let's try it. They held, but now the fort level's at two. So next turn, maybe we can actually break through here. Maybe. We have one down here, I'm trying to remember. I think we did 40 to 21, fort level three. What if, what if we move up the 36 guard? And what if we attack here? 5.8 to 4. Don't know that that's necessarily going to work. This still might be our best bet, 40 to 21. Let's do it. Nope, they held. Lost 6,000 men to their 500. Okay. And what if we take off the line these two units what if we take the 37th guard and move that down and we take this 284th rifle division what if we try it again now 21 21 let's do it let's do it we are held again Fortification level now down to one. Okay. So we have starting to soft them up a little, I feel. Um, but they did a pretty good job of holding their line. I wonder if we can't take another shot here at these units. So if we were to... Can you, can you make it down there? Let's take you off the line, and then let's just say, if you come here, and we're going to take you off the line too, we'll move you down. Let's try it. We're held again, my goodness. I'm trying really hard to break through as much as possible because the other thing that we now run into is they've now collapsed so far that if any of these hexes lose a battle, they cannot retreat themselves into another hex here because all the hexes have the chip limit of three units. And I think that means that they then surrender I think they surrender when that happens. Um, which then means it's just that many less men to have to fight. Okay, so we, we did collapse them by the two hexes. So I think that is within itself an accomplishment. But we really need to continue pressing, pressing here. Um, the other thing I'm encouraged by is when we look at the fortification levels. This is 0, 1, 1, 1, 2. I think that's really going to help us next turn because we're not going to be dealing with fours, threes, all of that nonsense, right? I think that is really going to help us next turn. So that's the Stalingrad pocket. Boy, just absolutely crazy how much, how much it's taking to knock these guys out. And I keep thinking about these instruction units and how much work they're going to have to do to repair these rail lines. But it's going to be so worth it, it and is needed. So let's move back down south again to the Caucasus regions. We moved a couple units up here to take this rail line. We're going to do something similar here, where we're just taking this unit far enough up that we capture this hex. And then we're going to take, I think we'll take the 151st because it's in a better um, supply situation and move them up to take this hex. We're going to take this mountain division, and we captured this airfield. 
and it looks like we looks like two construction units surrendered. I certainly wish they could come over our side. I'm assuming they didn't leave us any rail condition. Yeah, they did not. Okay. And then we're also going to look over here. We're going to take the 383rd. We're going to move them up. So that way now we have we control these hexes here between these cities. And then I'm also just going to move units up here onto the rail line to try to make it one day, uh, to try to make it easier for resupply to occur. So we are going to just try to get stacks here on rail lines and on towns. Now that I think about it, we're going to move all these here, go there, okay. So now at the very least, everyone is sitting on some type of line of supply, even if the rail line is damaged, okay? So there's that. Um, we might just go up here and can't help but be a little aggressive in that situation, right? Okay, so you're there. Here, I think we do want to just take this town. We had another construction brigade surrender, and it looks like a naval rifle brigade surrender, too. So that was pretty successful. Move you up just a little bit. Bring you there. Stay right where you are. Over here, we had this whole Crimea front. Um, we have not forgotten about that. And we're going to take a look here to see if it makes sense to try again. Because they have combat value of 1. Fortification level for them now is at 2. I think we have to just to try to keep the pressure on them. 2 to 1 odds. They held my goodness. That is so difficult. So difficult. Okay, we're, we're gonna have to withdraw that one there. Okay. All right. So I think that wraps up all the ground units that we had to move. Um, you know, we look at the map here and it's, it is so tempting because you just, you imagine that this entire pocket, just how empty it might be. We don't know for sure, but you imagine just how empty it might be and it gets you excited, right? Um, I will say that we're going to continue this strategy though. And now that we've zoomed out, this allows me to a little better explain one of my thought processes with why we're going to this column approach on these rail lines. And that is, if you can see it clearly enough, I, I hope you can, um, would it help at all if I did this rail icon? A little, but not much. Is if we can connect this column to these units, once Stalingrad is taken, that then gives us a line of supply to all of these armies, as opposed to supplies being routed all the way down to Astrakhan, down to Grozny, and then on trucks and lorries over to these units. Right? And all the way over to Crimea, frankly. It then gives us that supply line straight down, which will be immensely valuable as we look at beginning the assault on Rostov, Stalino, and continuing on towards Odessa. Um, that, that, that's kind of the, the reasoning and the thought for that. And as I look at how that all looks from a top view, I think I am going to just break that little rule I said, right? And just going to move that unit just a few more hexes. We'll just do a couple more. Ex now, when you look at it, we're, we're pretty zoomed in here. These units, they, they fit on the same screen together, right? If we can just connect these two lines and clear out Stalingrad, it opens up so much possibility for us. It, it's going to be absolutely monumental. Um, and then, too, these armies that currently make up a, I'm using air quotes here for radio, um, they make up this front line. When that is done, these then become extra forces that can be applied to specific tactical points for the offensive because we have enough units with these armies to maintain that front line, right? We don't need two layers worth of units defending a front line. So I, I 
really encouraged by how that is all panning out. Before we do click and turn, as I mentioned, we're going to take a look at a, um, a, a feature of War in the East and it was War in the East 2 and it was in War in the East as well. Um, and if you talk to veterans of the game, they're, they're going to rave about how useful this is. And, and frankly, I probably should have mentioned this in an earlier episode just due to its value. But I, I think one of the reasons I didn't was I did try to hop right into the game. And when you start playing this game and other Gary Grigsby's games, all of the metrics and details and and layers that exist behind the scenes that calculate everything, just all, all of the universe that the game does simulate and, and replicate for you is so immense that sometimes you look at it and you go, no, I don't need more detail. Holy crap, I've got enough detail just looking at the map. If I have any more detail, I'm going to pull my hair out. And I think maybe because I had that emotion for a while, especially beginning this scenario and in my past attempts to get into the series that I, I tried to shy away from this because when you first look at this feature that we're about to talk about, it, it seems so data heavy and so overwhelming. And that feature, drum roll please, is the commander's report. And when you're on info screens in your navigation tab, you'll see it right here with this icon with a picture of what I, I interpret to be a, a book with a flag on it, right? So this is kind of the commander's report, their journal, what have you. And the way that I have started to think about this, because it translates to my, my real life profession, is it, it's kind of like a, a leader or a manager's um, master Excel sheet that is like their budget, it's their P&L, it's whatever whatever they might use, right, to manage their finances and their business, like that one document they rely on. I think that's probably a good parallel to draw with the commander's report in War in the East 2. Is it's kind of that almost Excel um, relational data setup that, that you're used to in maybe the business world. Um, except it's for a video game that simulates war on the Eastern Front in World War II. Um, and the commander's report is, is very interactive. It's very customizable, and by far one of my favorite things now that I have started to play with it a little is all of these things we're going to go over in these views, the game will actually export this for you. So if you want it to, you could interact with all of this data in Excel, Google Sheets, what, whatever it is you, you may prefer, right? You can actually click export and it's going to go out and it's going to save it to a game save file not a game save file, excuse me, into one of the folders for where the, the game stores save information and such. Um, so that way you can just take this data and, and play with it a little outside of the game environment. And I think that the series has a great reputation of, of this wonderful community that, that likes to take things like this and create tools for the users. And what I'm reminded of is uh, War in the Pacific Admirals Edition there's actually a, a couple of third-party modded tools, if you will, that will actually do something similar with the game where it extracts this data and then out of the game client gives you a way to review all of these critical pieces of information in a format that is not tied to the game's user interface, right? So when you're designing a game, the user interface constraints they have to be a little more rigid than how you may want to manipulate data. There's no drag and drop functionality, usually in the video game realm. So let's actually get into the commander's report and what it has. And we're gonna spend a lot of time just looking on the unit tab today. We will come back to this and look a little bit more at the other tabs in future episodes. But right off the bat, you're presented with this and it says, hey, you've got 566 units. That number alone can just sound a little overwhelming, right? Think about that. You're playing a video game where the scenario is 130 turns. It takes a couple hours for each turn. And by the way, you're managing 566 units. 
not only are you 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 managing just where they are on the map, you're managing their fatigues, their uh, TOE, their armaments, their upgrades, all of these factors. It's quite immense. You get a very high level overview, right? Of you know what you're looking at. 4.6 million men and actually forgive me I, I had something filtered here so <laughs> this really emphasizes my point my goodness I, I had forgotten that I had formation type filter to infantry to make this a little more bearable the first time we looked at it if you actually select all of the formations right now we're showing 2,314 units I just spent 30 seconds raving about how large of a number it is to manage 566 units when really I didn't even realize that's one-fourth of how many there actually are. 2,314 units. Now, is it fair that, yes, some of these are air bases, installations, etc.? Sure. But if we were doing manual air management of the air campaign, and if we didn't have six straight weeks of Russian winter blizzards, right, um... This might be very meaningful to us. But anyways, you have on the top line how many units there are, total number of men that are uh, representing here. So 7.5 million, 120,000 guns, 13,000 armored fighting vehicles, and 5,800 airframes. It doesn't even all display on this one view, which by the way, you have to scroll pretty far to get to the bottom. You actually can cycle through page one, page two, page three to try to view everything. So now that I've impressed upon you the, the scale and the size of what's available to you, and again, reinforcing the, the scale of the game, let's now talk about how the commander's report is so wonderful because it gives you the tools you need to be able to manage that scale. One of the very first things that I find most impressive is this little arrow icon which to, to be just a little critical of the game, it's not a big critique, but just a little critical, is if you just opened up the commander's report and you're a day one player and you haven't read the manual, you would have no idea unless by just clicking around you decided to click this. But when you do, it actually allows you to configure which columns you're looking at. So if you really, if we're sitting here and we're going, you know what? It's really cool that it tells me how many battles this unit has won and lost. But frankly, I have enough things to look at. So maybe one day I'll come back to it, but right now I don't need to think about it. You also have these like withdraw turns and withdraw destinations, right? For if the unit is withdrawing, how long and where is it going to go? You probably don't need to think about that for 99% of the time that us, us in this episode 15 of this series, right, need to think about. I am quite certain there are veterans of the game that would say, no, that is critically important if you know what you're doing. We're, we're going to keep that off for a minute. One of the columns that I would recommend that you add is this MP, which stands for movement points. And I want to give a, a shout out and credit here to Bemilis. I, I hope I'm pronouncing that uh, semi-accurately from the um, Matrix Games forums, there's actually a thread with tips and tricks to navigating the commander's report, and he called this out as one of his favorites, and, and we're going to come back to this movement points column once we're done looking through this configuration to, to kind of utilize this for the turn that we're actually currently in. Then you have things like supply priority. If we were managing the actual priority of each of our units for what their supply priority should be, this would be insanely useful to be able to see, okay, have I gone a little, a little crazy and I'm in turn 50 and it turns out that every turn I kept turning units to priority four, priority four, and now all the units that I have are priority four because I wouldn't stop putting them there, right? This is a good way to kind of get a glance at that. Then you have these different things such as status. So here you can see these units are actually depleted. Um, this is the max TOE and this is the TOE percent. I probably don't need to care about the max TOE for most situations. What I do care about is a bit of a novice to the game is what is the TOE percent, right? So if, if you're considering that the division is supposed to have, I'm going to make this up, um, 
50 T-34 tanks, but it only has 10 T-34 tanks, if that was all you were looking at, its TOE percent would be 20%. You're sitting there going, it's at one-fifth its strength. That's really not a good situation. Combat prep is just listed as prep. So that's the, the cross swords icon that we look at all the time in game to see, you know, what, how, how ready for battle is this unit, which then influences their combat value. Then we have their actual combat value. So here you can see we have a lot of ones, which, you know, just right off the bat makes me a little nervous, especially considering all the conservative tones we just layered into these episodes about supply concerns. Then we have fatigue, experience, morale, um, aircraft in unit. You know what? I, I'm going to be honest with you guys. I need to research what that is because I'm not sure. I'm assuming, I'm just going to take a guess here. I'm assuming that it's reflective when you're looking at an airbase, how many aircraft are in that airbase. That's my, my best guess right now, but I'll, I'll try to research that and find out. Armored fighting vehicles, guns, men. Yeah, that makes sense, right? Let's, let's see how many of each of those there are. And then distance to headquarters, DTQH, or HQ, excuse me. Again, this is a recommendation by Bimilis. We're going to go through kind of his process he suggests uh, in just a moment here. So we're going to leave this column on because I find this, uh, through his suggestion, uh, to be very useful. And then we have, what is the theater box? So we've played around with theater boxes quite a bit already, right? Where we know there's the map, there's the Far East, Northern, Transcaucus, etc. This identifies where that unit is in one of those theater boxes. It also has a column for what the city is. Um, so if it is in a particular city, you can see that. We're going to leave that unchecked because for most units, we're not going to be in a city. And really, this is most useful for the actual basis. Then we have the HHQ, which is just, you know, what the, the layer above this unit, what is its HQ, right? So for most of these divisions, it'll say, what is the army that it is part of? Order of battle here, or excuse me, unit order of battle. This would say, okay, a rifle division in the first week of 1943. This might get just a little, a little confusing, right? Um, this unit, it's kind of structure how many of what things it has, right? It's built off of this template, right? It's 42B, 1942 B, probably for the second version of it, rifle division. And when the Soviet Union was making rifle divisions and thinking about what is the perfect rifle division look like in 1942, their second iteration of it was this. And this unit is modeled after that. We don't necessarily need to see that detail here. We're, we're gonna skip off that. This is type, so is it motorized, is it armor, is it infantry? We're gonna leave this on. Size, right, so this is, is it a division, brigade, corps, etc. We're gonna take this off just because we can rely upon the, the descriptor uh, for a lot of that information. And then nationality, we're also gonna take that off um, for no other reason than it's much more of a concern for the Axis player than it is necessarily for the Soviet player. So now that we've done that, we hit that arrow again, and now we have our customized view of the commander's report. I really wish I would have stepped into this sooner, because I think this is perhaps one of the, the hidden gems of this series that most new players coming into it probably won't look at unless, as I kind of have been through my learnings of the game, been steered in that direction by veterans of the community and, and helpful guides, right? Um, because this, this it, it feels now that it's something that I want to look at. It, it's not where I have to go, okay, skipping this column, skipping this column, because I, I don't care about what's here. This is what I want to look at. So now that we've customized it a little bit, I'll also show you that you have these little filter icons. You can click this filter icon, and then right here it says from 0 to um, 31,200. So I'm assuming that means that the highest unit in this entire list has 31,000 men. If we click this, this little yellow text, we can then say, what is this range? So what we can do is we can say, show me units that have 10,000 men 
all the way up to 15,000 men, right? And now that is all that returns. I did not pick a very useful example for where that might be, be needed, um, but that's how it works. And to clear it, we just then remove it there. Nope, I did that wrong, I'm sorry. We click here and, you see I've now forgotten. Let's do zero and then 31,200. Did I not do that right? Zero. 31,200. Oh, come on now. Thought clicking that got rid of it, but it doesn't look like it does. What if we did, let's try this. Let's do one to 31, 200. Okay. Um, I have a little bit of research to, to do of how to remove that. Oh, I, jeez, I'm sorry guys. Right here in the bottom, clear all filters. So click that, the filter's gone. So now we see all units here. By clicking on the actual header, it sorts it, right? Um, so that way you can get it in a particular order. Largest, smallest, smallest, largest, and then just the original sort. All right. So we've gone over a lot of how to interact on the top. On the bottom here, these are just kind of common things that you may want to search by. So for example, what I had this on earlier was for formation type, I wanted to look just at infantry units. I'm actually going to expand this for the scenario that we're going to, to go through. And again, this was recommended by the Millis in the Matrix forums in the War Room under the, the thread title is Getting the Most of the Commander's Report. Um, I will link it in the YouTube channel so it's easy for everyone to find. And we're just going to go through and we're going to select units here. Kind of makes sense for us. It's like forts and all of that we really don't want to look at. We're gonna we're gonna look at two things. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at movement points and we're gonna sort this from largest to smallest. And I think this is absolutely brilliant in its simplicity. And what this is saying then is that this unit here, the fifth guard's mechanized core, has 41 movement points. And if you're going through and if you're managing um, 1,405 units is apparently how many armored, mechanized, motorized, infantry, artillery, cavalry, etc. units we have. If you're going through 1,400 units every turn you play of this game, you might want to say, hey, did I miss moving someone? This is a really way, good way to go about it. Is we're going to go through these first couple units and say, yeah, did I maybe miss doing something with this guy? Because in a lot of situations, unless maybe this turn like we are in, where we have kind of this whole supply dilemma that we're faced with, we probably want to move that unit somewhere. And looking at more details about it, right? It's got 100 combat preparation. Its TOE is fantastic. Combat value of 14. This is probably a unit that can do a lot of things. Okay, so great. The commander's report told us there was this unit we should probably look at. Now what? Now you just have to click the name of the unit and look, it brings you directly to the unit. So now we see that we have the division details, or excuse me, not the, the unit details of the fifth guard's mechanized core. We see all the details of the unit. We, we've looked at the screen before, right? We're gonna close out of this. We're gonna scroll out and say, oh, this guy is sitting in Moscow, he's attached to Stavka, meaning he doesn't have necessarily a frontline army HQ. He's just sitting here. He's not doing anything. Well, let's get him up to the front line so we can use him. He has enough movement points to literally get all the way to the front line in this turn. So I think what we're going to do is just now, we're going to take a look at our front line and say, who could use this very strong, powerful unit that is very fresh and ready to get into the fight. Um, and looking at the situation here, I think where we're probably going to 
put them is right here in this pocket because in my mind, we talked about this in the previous episode, it's in this area right here where I think we have an opportunity to push west and to start putting pressure on these units to either say, okay, we need to withdraw so we're not cut off, or to actually maybe have a chance at encircling some of them. So I think this is where we have an opportunity that if we throw a few extra forces here, this could really help the situation. And now we're just going to attach it to probably the 33rd Army Corps, I think, or the 29th Army. That's fine. That works too. They're, they're right here in this front line as well. That's not a problem. So that is a perfect example of how useful the commander's report is. We're going to go back to it and just see what other examples are there that we can do of the same thing. And here we see the 25th Tank Corps, 41 movement points again. This one is attached to the 6th Army. And it does look like it's probably been in some battle. Its CV is lower. Its prep's a little lower. Um, but let's just see if maybe this was a unit that we forgot to move. And this one is actually in this pocket here. So that makes sense, right? Is uh, We're leaving these here in this defensive position. Go back to the report. And let's take a look at this third mechanized. Same thing, right? We're just kind of holding the line with that one. We're just going to do a few more to see what else might exist. Fourth guards. Yeah, again, right? We, we have them on the front line holding there. That's fine. Fourth guard tanks. That, yeah, we had gone through and done these. And here you see that their fatigue is actually pretty high. They have low combat prep, so it makes sense that we were holding off on that. I think we'll do... Just one more here. Let's look at the 10th Tank Corps. The 10th Tank Corps is actually right where we move these units. But again, if you look at it, higher fatigue, almost no combat prep, right? So we're going to leave that just as it is. So that's one way you can use the commander's report. And if you do this at the end of every turn, it's probably going to be pretty useful. Now, I think I'm probably going to start to get into the habit of doing so. But since this is kind of, I would almost view it as maybe clerical end of turn type of stuff, I'll probably end up doing it off camera. Because if every single feature we end up reviewing, if I do all of them in every turn, we're going to end up needing three or four hours for every episode probably. As I walk through, explain everything, and, and go through all this detail. That's not to say that as we add new features, I'm never going to show them in any of the episodes. We will come back to this. We'll talk more about it right in future episodes. We'll go over some of these other tabs a little more. But I don't think every single turn I'm going to show you things that I do on this screen. I'm probably just going to use it as a check for myself to do a little bit behind the scenes. The second one that Bamilis recommends to do with the commander's report is to take your distance to headquarters and to see, you know what? Do you maybe have some units that are a little too far away from their HQ? And looking at this, it looks like we might. So right off the bat, we have the 19th Cannon Artillery Division. And it's part of the Stalingrad Front, but it's 45 hexes away. Where the heck is this thing? Let's scroll out. And the Stalingrad Front... Is that down here? I think it is. No, it's not. It is over here. Well, how is that 41 hexes away then? I might be missing something. So this one we might skip over and I'll have to research what's going on there. But all of that aside, yeah, I actually think I'm going to move up this artillery unit though to help with... Um, are kind of surrounding and pocket of Stalingrad, and then I'm going to change this HQ over to the 66th Army here. Back to the commander's report. These Moscow defense zones, I did take a, a peek at these already. These we're going to leave just as is because these have that delay, I think it was, to come in and, and enter the fray. Um, and we know exactly where they are. They're, they're right there on the border of Moscow. We'll look at a couple more here, like the 110th Cavalry Division. 
it, and this is this is the perfect reason for the commander's report. I had forgotten that we had moved this unit here because three or four turns ago we spotted a German army that looked like it was on the border. And the border, by the way, was like back here, back in the day, if you can remember that far ago. Um, and we had brought it up on this rail line to be kind of a, a QRF uh, reactionary force to if they tried to cut off our lines of supply to the Caucasus region. Well, that's not an issue anymore. So we're going to take this unit and we're actually going to bring it back up to the front. And when we get it up here, we're going to assign it to one of these HQ units. And next turn, we'll, we'll try to remember to take a look at that one. Let's look at just one more here. This one is Stavka. And it's 34 away, and it's a rifle brigade. I'm guessing that we actually probably don't need a rifle brigade attached to Stavka that is 34 hexes away. And if we scroll out here, yeah, look at this. We don't need a rifle brigade this far back from the front, right? So what we're going to do is let's, let's move this one by rail, and let's move this somewhere that it's going to be useful. And I think we'll bring it... Hmm. I think we're going to bring it down here to this pocket to help with our, our eventual breakout here. I'm either going to bring it here or over here by Vornez. I think I'm going to do over here. So that unit is now on the move via rail. We're probably not going to have enough, I forget what this is called, I think it's strategic movement, something like that, um, to unload it off the train this turn, but that's okay. Still moving. The, the speed at which units move on the map, by the way, is an adjustable feature when you look at the preferences for game settings. And betting we can't. Yep, strategic movement points, that, that's what it is. We need 100, we only have 52. So next turn, we'll have to unload that off the rail line. Not a problem. So, so that kind of sums up our, um, our quick review of the commander's report. And again, we'll keep coming back to this to keep adding new and fun things. Fun, right? Working with data in a video game. Fun things you can do with this to, to help your playthrough of your own scenarios. So with that, we're now going to, out of paranoia, click the Manage Depots again, because I can't remember if I did that in the last episode. And then we're going to end turn, and then we'll close out the episode. And yes, for sure. This is going to go through and uh, continue doing our air resupplies, just like it does every turn. I'm, I'm pretty happy with how things are progressing in this scenario. Um... Again, I, I know a little bit about the history on the Eastern Front in preparation for getting into war in the East, too. I've also I've started to pick up a couple books. There's, there's one particularly it portrays the, the life or the view from the point of view of a, a German soldier, multiple German soldiers, different accounts, by I think it was James Lucas. Um, and that's been pretty exciting to to read through and get kind of the perspective, right, of how different units interacted. And that's where my insights came on the self-propelled guns a little earlier. But again, not not having a complete understanding of the entire timeline of the Eastern Front, I really don't have a great historical gauge to go off of. Now, we haven't gone over this feature yet, but the game will actually show you um, for different, like, let's just say Smolensk, for example, it will actually show you the date at which the Germans first captured Smolensk and then the historical date that the Soviets recaptured and, and got the city back. And you can use that as a player, as a guide to kind of see, you know, am I ahead of the historical schedule or am I a little behind it? In a lot of ways, I, I'm trying to avoid getting too deep of an understanding because I like that we're kind of exploring the the scenario and this challenge, right, of pushing back the German forces without knowing a lot of that history, where there's lessons of, you know, different breakout methods and the importance of encirclements and different tactics that were used just broadly on the Eastern Front. 
of course, going to take a look at those and try to employ them where we can. But I really don't want to know. Yeah, you know, by February, the Soviets had recaptured Smolensk of 1943, right? I don't really have an interest in finding that out because I like the, the challenge of us going through and just saying, you know what? What's our approach to it? How, how are we progressing? And let's kind of come up with our own path to victory. Um, and I, I feel like we're, we're succeeding in that. Victory points, when we looked at it a couple turns ago on the metric screen, were, it doesn't show that we have a, a overwhelming majority or win right now, but we're not losing either. Um, but when I look at the map, I feel like we're in really good positions. The concern that I have from a strategic view is what I've reiterated throughout this episode and the previous is just not understanding all of the mechanics of the game. I now worry a little bit in turn nine of are we overextending ourselves with supplies and how can we kind of manage against that? Here we see that they're doing counterattacks by Leningrad again. As I was expecting, we're holding because we really quite reinforced there. And I think this is them saying, boy, we really don't want to have to withdraw. So let's maybe try to put a little pressure. Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what we can do there. Here we were actually retreated. This is by the Smolensk front. And we had another unit there. So this is two battle losses near the Smolensk front. Three now. Again, I jinx myself when I say these things. But I think a lot of this is down to the supply situation that these units found themselves in. Those units that were retreating, a number of them looked like they were already in low supply. Um, and it also looks like most of those attacks were with motorized and panzer units. Um, so this is just kind of the stereotypical right German counterattack that the Soviets and other allies... Uh, faced throughout World War II of the quick responses and counterattacks to your moves on a front line is what we just witnessed there near Smolensk. And it actually looks like they're pretty much done with their turn. They're just redrawing the defensive lines. Um, it would seem that anything, anything east and south of Smolensk, they didn't want to touch, which I, I find a little interesting. Um, and I do wonder... If they're done with their reserve line and such, it actually looks like they opened some stuff up over here for us. If you if you see this here, right, there's there's a lot more gaps in the line than there were just last episode. Now the Germans are going through and doing their air resupply. If you remember after this, it's going to go on to our Soviet um, forces logistics phase, and then we'll be at the end of the... Well, we'll be at the beginning of turn nine and the end of the episode. Doesn't look like there's too many losses for them as they run these missions, but it also looks like a lot of these supply reinforcements that they're running aren't necessarily crossing a front line of battle, right? They're not going into pockets. I mean, they're, they're sitting there running air resupply to Orel, a, a city that is just two hexes from the front line. Now it's going through and doing the logistics for us. 50% done already. I also want to give a, a big shout out to, to the Matrix Forums community for this game. Uh, I, I've been a, a viewer and a lurker on there for not only this game, but for the other Gary Grigsby series games for quite a while, and just the the in-depth knowledge and passion that so many of the community members have there for these games is, is really oppressive and should be applauded, that they, they not only have stuck through the series for, for decades now, literally decades, um, but they have taken their own time to invest into understanding the underlying mechanics and, and to help others by coming to that community. So I I think certainly they deserve a great amount of credit for the success of these games. And if you yourself only look at this game and other games uh, that are published by Matrix on YouTube, I'd, I'd encourage you to also take a look at their forums, even if it's not your traditional medium to understand new games and mechanics. It really is a fantastic community. All of that aside, we now have ended the turn eight and beginning of turn nine is where we're at. 
We have our turn summary we'll go over quickly. Friendly losses were at about 68,000 for men, and I think that is the highest that we have had in any uh, episode or turn. Uh, we have been averaging about 60,000, but I think this might be the highest we've seen. We lost 1,200 guns, 575 armored fighting vehicles, 370 airframes. The order of battle changes is on the map. We actually were net negative 100,000 men, negative 840 guns, 270 armored fighting vehicles, net negative 10 airframes. The theater boxes, though, we saw growth in most areas. For the Germans, they saw growth, but really, for men, it was pretty flat. For guns, it was pretty flat. For armored fighting vehicles, again, they had positive 138. I think this is now three turns in a row they've been positive, so that's not a trend I like to see because we really do rely on having a numerical advantage against the Germans when it comes to armored fighting vehicles, um, especially as when you consider armored warfare, uh, the attackers really do suffer often um, from having to advance on a front line in armor because of the defensive prowess of, uh, for example, the German 88 uh, field piece, right, that, that could just do damage to any, any tank the Soviets ever created. Um, so normally the attacker, when it comes to armored warfare, does need that numerical advantage. We see for combat unit alerts. Okay, so how do I phrase this? It's an improvement. We should be happy about it. We've gone from like 135 to 120 for number of units on low supply. I think the downside there is we still have 120 units that are low supply. And that is nearly a fourth of our units are on low supply. That really does have me worried. And I think it's going to be the focus of this turn and the next turn in how do we best manage that by maybe level setting expectations a little on how aggressive we are in our offensive maneuvers. Real quick, we're going to take a look at the uh, new events. Oh, and actually looks like there are quite a few. So RAF begins long range raids. Um, and this is having an impact to the German forces in terms of manpower available. Um, and I think this is just details of the raids. So this must grow in strength over time or, or go up and down right in terms of the amount of damage in the raids. The 8th Air Force, and this is the, I believe, the U.S. Strategic Bomber Wing, um, was targeting railroads and heavy industry, which caused damage. The Germans, though, saw success in the air in North Africa. And this, I think this is a little historical here, where this ebbed back and forth. And they, they had air superiority for quite a while. So what this means is, again, North African campaign events that go against the Germans have been delayed even further. And the bad news for us is that means pressure put upon them by needing to send more and more forces to North Africa. That pressure is now delayed because of this success. It also pushed back the campaign events for the Italian campaign, right? Because eventually um, the Allied forces do, do an amphibious landing in Sicily and then an invasion of Italy from there. Soviet partisan activity in Germany continues to increase. An unconditional surrender. This actually looks like it's a bit of reading here. And I think what it is, is just kind of the allies during the war, right? They, they kind of said, listen, our, our fight is not against the German people. Our fight is against Hitler. It's against Mussolini. It's against um, the, you say military forces. I, I don't know how best to phrase that, of, of Japan, right? Uh, that have committed these evil things. Um, and it wasn't some type of belief that it had to be the complete destruction of the German peoples, right? Uh, it, it's a bit of a propaganda PR thing that the Allies had, had tried to communicate. So I don't see that it actually has any game impacts in terms of scenario or anything like that. I think it's just a, a for-flavor uh, event. 
from what I can tell here reading it. All right. So that brings us to the end of episode 15. As always, thank you so much for taking the time to watch and follow along through our Let's Play series. Should you have any questions or commentary or feedback for the videos or our playthrough, please add them to the comments and I'll do my best to address them. And also, if you, if you feel willing to do, please like, subscribe to the channel. It really helps get uh, not only this series available to players who may want to get some help stepping into the game, but also gets the name of this game out there a little bit better in terms of search results. So that way more people can find War in the East too. And it's, it's fantastic um, offerings to, to video gamers, specifically you, the strategy gamer. So with that, have yourselves a great day and we'll see you next time. Bye now.